Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you very much for being here. My name is Russell Shorto. I'm the director of the John Adams Institute. I would like to thank all of you. I would like to thank uh, the Harmony Publishers for bringing our author. I'm very pleased to have David Levitt here. For one thing, as an American of uh, roughly the same age, um, I read his first novel, The Lost Language of Cranes, when it came out in, in 1986, I think. And um, is that right? A and, um, and aside from the fact that it was, um, that it, it, it revealed the, the, the idea that parents had secret lives, it, wa it began for me, um, uh, you know, as a reader, there are certain people who you read and then you follow them, and then you kind of go through adulthood together. So uh, it's very uh, nice for me to have David Levitt here for that reason. I'm not here, I'm not going to introduce him, however, I'm going to introduce our moderator first. Uh, Tim Overdeek is the deputy editor-in-chief of NOS News and the NOS uh, Journal, which I was recently told ranks as one of the top five most identifiable Dutch brands right up there with the Hema and Albert Heijn. Um, he is also a, a true student of America and American culture. He was formerly the American correspondent for the NOS. And he, um, his last event uh, for us was moderating uh, the event with David Sedaris, which, was, uh, which is more difficult than it sounds. It's a little bit like uh, lion taming, I think, knowing when to jump out of the way. Um, and he also has written one book about Rick Smith, speaking of Dutch-American crossovers. Rick Smith, who was the center for the uh, Indiana, Indiana Pacers in the, in the NBA. Um, and uh, for, for people who uh, grew up actually uh, watching basketball at the same time The Lost Language of Cranes came out, Rick Smith was a, was a major figure. Uh, without any further ado, let me introduce Tim Overdeek. Tim. Thank you, Russell. Good evening. Uh, let's just uh, first have a show of hands. Who, who, who in this audience is actually a mathematician? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, who, who knows his or her math pretty decently? That's a bit more. Who knows nothing about math? <laughs> okay, great, 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 great. That's good for me. Because not too long ago, our oldest son, Sander, who is 11 years old, uh, was doing his homework, math. It was obvious he was having difficulties. And at some point, sitting at the dining room table, he threw down his pen, frustrated. He couldn't remember how to solve the particular problem he, had, uh, he was facing. I, as a dad, offered my help. He gladly accepted. Turned out, couldn't help him. I just had no idea how to help him solve the problem. His math was too difficult for me. Eventually, he did figure it out, which was quite another parental moment, being outsmarted by your own 11-year-old child in math. So when Russell um, called me to ask if uh, whether I wanted to moderate this evening with uh, David Levitt, uh, I might have been a little too quick to accept the privilege, and a privilege it sure is. Um, picking up a copy of the Indian clerk, I should have been forewarned by its cover. Indian with the number one for the letter I, um, clerk with the number three for the letter E. I checked the number of pages, I can count, 478, so I figured no time to lose, a couple of weeks to go. That kind of math isn't too difficult for me to grasp, but there is a lot of math in the book. Of course, it's about mathematicians, the best in the world, teaching, studying at Cambridge at the beginning of the 20th century, with the main characters leading into and dealing with the Great War. But Honestly, it's, if you've read it, it's much more than math alone. And to be really honest, and let me confess, and let me apologize to you, Mr. Levitt, whenever I got to the math bits in your book, I just skipped it. Sorry. I went on autopilot as a reader and moved on to what this beautiful book is really about, I think, love. Love and all its different shapes and forms, and sometimes dazzlingly complicated calculations. The Indian clerk focuses on the real-life partnership between the British mathematician G.H. Hardy and his Indian protege Ramanujan. Hardy is astonished by the genius of Ramanujan, an Indian clerk who, largely unschooled, writes rudimentary proofs that are brilliant even in their mistakes. Hardy campaigns to have him brought to England on a scholarship and then pushes and pushes and pushes 
him towards solving the infamous Riemann hypothesis. We'll have Mr. Levitt explain us the Riemann stuff. I never got it. What I did get, though, were not only the fascinating tales of England during World War I, the extremely accurate, I think, and detailed description of university life affected by young men going to war and either coming back physically wounded, mentally scarred, or just in a body bag, but also the tales of relationships, especially that, between men and women left behind, between teacher and student, man and man, hidden, obvious, open, and coded homosexuality, which is a main recurring theme in David Levitt's work. Also tales of husband and wife, a married woman, her lover, upper class, working class, all based on actual events and real people. It is not really historical novel though, it's literary fiction based on facts and quotes like this one by G.H. Hardy about Ramanujan, and I quote, he was probably the one romantic incident in my life. Around this, the Indian clerk revolves. David Levitt was born in 1961. The youngest of three children, Levitt grew up in the upper middle class world of academia and intellectualism. His father was a professor of organizational behavior at Stanford University, and his mother, as you understand, was homemaker and sometime political activist. Levitt himself graduated from Yale in 1983 with a degree in English, having studied creative writing and literary history. While still at university, he made his name as an author. Not only was he one of the youngest writers ever to have a story published in The New Yorker when he was 20 years of age, uh, but Territory, the name of the story, was the first with an openly gay theme to be published by this prestigious magazine. That story and eight others that came became Levitt's first book, Family Dancing, in 1984, a book that received high critical acclaim for its insightful um, characterizations of the intricacies of family relationships and for its masterful evocations of the secrets and boundaries that define those relationships. His career is long, impressive, varied, so let's stop right here and do the very basic math. Add it all up. Ladies and gentlemen, after many essays, many stories, novels, non-fiction books, and yes, controversy around some of his work, we find ourselves here tonight in the company of, simply said, a remarkably accomplished author. More than a pleasure, certainly a privilege to introduce to you David Levitt. Thank you. That was a wonderful introduction. Um, uh, I was glad to hear my, my parents evoked. Um, my father died in December of 2007, which was not that long ago. And uh, he's been on my mind a lot lately, so it's, it's, it's nice to hear him mentioned. Um, it's also great to be back at the in, in Amsterdam. Uh, this is actually the third time I've been here at the John Adams Institute, and, and it's, it's a pleasure to be back. It's been quite a few years. Uh, the last time I was here, I believe, was in the, the late 90s with, with Edmund White. We sort of interviewed each other. Um, <coughs> and uh, I was actually telling a, a, a funny story about a language mistake that after the event, Edmund and I were, were signing books. And, and at that point, I think it was fairly well known, well it was quite well known that he was, he was HIV positive, but, but very healthy. And, and one of the, the people who had a book for him to sign said to him, um, I am, I'm very much hoping that you won't be dead soon. Um, and, and we both laughed because and I thought about it subsequently and I think in some ways that's, that's really all we can say to each other anymore. I'm very, I, I really hope you won't be dead soon. Um, <coughs> anyway, he, 14 years later probably, he's alive and well, I'm glad to say. Um, well, I'm going to read a, a, a very brief chapter from The Indian Clerk, and then um, we'll talk. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm still sort of reeling from that introduction. I was very, very moved and flattered. Um, this is a, a short chapter, and it's one of the very few chapters in the book that's told from the point of view of Ramanujan. Uh, Srinivasa Ramanujan, uh, as Tim said, was a... a a real person. He was a, a, a an Indian mathematician born into a high caste but very poor Brahmin Hindu family in South India uh, at the end of the 19th century. 
Um, and he was virtually self-taught as a mathematician. He, uh, he kept failing out of, 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 of schools because he was so uh, completely focused on mathematics that he would be unable to complete or, or pass his exams in other subjects. Um, and the Indian educational system at that time really wasn't able to cope with someone who was the absolute opposite of a well-rounded student. But Ramanujan was persistent, and I think he, he understood that he was a genius. And he started writing letters to famous mathematicians in England, and the third letter that he wrote was to G.H. Hardy, who was, who was at that point considered the, the great um, and still quite young uh, British number theorist. And Hardy, instead of ignoring his letter or throwing it away or assuming that this Indian was a crank, actually took the letter very seriously and wrote back to Ramanujan. And a correspondence began, which ultimately, which culminated in, in, in Hardy inviting Ramanujan to come to Cambridge. And the novel really traces the years of their collaboration, the years that Ramanujan lived in Cambridge, which were the years of the First World War. Um, he arrived in April of 1914, and he wasn't able to go back to India till after the war. Um, and then he died shortly thereafter. Um, two, two of another uh, pre predominant, uh, I would say, preoccupation of this book, besides mathematics, is food. Um, this is in part a reflection of my own uh, obsession with food. And it's also partly a reflection of the, the realities that Ramanujan faced as a very strict vegetarian living in wartime England. And the, the chapter that I'm going to read, which again is a very, very brief chapter from Ramanujan's point of view, uh, in this chapter he's preparing rasam. Do you know, ra have any of you had rasam? Rasam is a, a wonderful, very spicy uh, South Indian lentil soup. And uh, I think that's all I need to tell you. Once again, Ramanujan is making rasam in his jip room. It's the middle of January, 1916. He's wearing two jumpers and a woolen muffler made especially for him, Hardy told him, by a writer who, having developed acute insomnia as a result of war worries, has taken up knitting as a means of passing the long nights. Now the writer generates upwards of 20 mufflers a week, most of which he sends to the troops in France. This one, however, he made specially for Ramanujan when he learned of his difficulties coping with the English winter. The muffler is green and orange. No, not green and orange, Hardy corrected himself when he presented it to Ramanujan. Mint and saffron. Strachey insisted that I say mint and saffron. In fact, the green is more the shade of banana leaves than mint leaves, while the orange lacks saffron's hint of gold. It brings to mind ripe mangoes or turmeric. As it happens, Ramanujan is just now spooning some turmeric into a bowl. The lentils for the rasam sit in a second bowl. Picking through them for bits of grit, as his mother taught him to do, he spills a few on the tabletop. As he swoops them together, he counts them. Seven lentils. How many ways can you divide up seven lentils? Well, he tests it out. You could divide them into seven groups of one each, or one of six and one of one, or one of five and two of one each, or one of five and one of two, or one of four and one of three, or one of four and one of two and one of one, or three of two each and one of one, or 15 in all. Yes, you can divide seven lentils up 15 ways. So how many ways can you divide up eight lentils? Carefully, he takes a single lentil from the bowl and puts it on the table with the others eight groups of one each, one group of seven and one of one, one group of six and one of two, one group of six and two of one each, 22 ways. And nine, 30 ways. He keeps going. He does not eat. It is well past midnight by the time he has worked out the number of ways you can divide up 20 lentils. And by then, lentils are everywhere, spread out over the table in neat configurations, on the floor, under the hob, some, he will soon discover, have migrated into his bed. They stick to the fibers of the muffler made by the famous writer. For the next year, his bed maker, when she does the sweeping, will find them in her dustpan. In 1994, an engineering student from Jakarta, while trying to retrieve a lost contact lens, will excavate one from the gap between two floorboards. The rasam remains uncooked. 
627 ways. And uh, this is my rather fanciful uh, imagining of how Ramanujan came up with his theory of partitions, which is one of uh, his most famous discoveries. And um, I guess we'll go from there. Shall I come sit down in the chair? Okay, here you go. Thank you, uh, David. <laughs> of course, we will open up the floor uh, not too long from now. I'm sure you have a lot of questions. Is the microphone okay this way? It's okay, great. Um, before we get to the book, and we will get to the book, um, why is your father in your mind recently? Well, my father d died in December of 2007, and, and, and um, he died after, after a short but fairly... Uh, fairly um, serious illness. In other words, he was sick for about two months before he died, but he was very, very sick before he died. And, and I think it's, it's a fairly common thing to have a kind of delayed reaction to the death of a parent, especially when, when the death has involved a certain amount of suffering and, and your initial reaction is one of relief. And um, uh, so, so the answer is, is, is I'm not sure exactly why, uh, but, but um, he's... I, I actually have one one clue as to why I'm thinking about my father, and that's quite simply that I have two friends who right now are dealing with very sick fathers, and they've been telling me about their experiences, which have brought my own to mind. But, you know, in my experience, you know, a year and a half afterwards, that's maybe when it sort of hits you mm. uh, because it almost takes that long to process. Um, and, again, when someone has died... It, at, a, at an old age, my father was 86, when he's been very ill, you know, the, the initial reaction, at least my initial reaction was relief, and, and it took a while to get past relief to the point where I thought, I really miss him. What do you miss? What I miss? Well, um, you know, it's funny, I had a very, I had a very, uh, odd, my father and I had a very odd relationship. We didn't actually, we weren't, it wasn't, a very verbal relationship, which is funny because I'm such a talker. Uh, but uh, there was a kind of quiet, he had a very quiet meditative quality, um, whereas everyone else in my family is, is completely sort of noisy and hysterical. My father was always the quiet one, and I think I miss his quiet. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, there are odd things. Uh, after my mother died, my mother died now almost 25 years ago, my mother did crossword puzzles, and I started doing crossword puzzles. Well, my father was a great player of solitaire, and after he died, I started playing solitaire. Uh, For how many hours a day? I don't. I, I, I plead the Fifth Amendment. I won't <laughs> confess. Did you take it off your computer at some I, point? It's on my computer, yes. It goes everywhere with me. And I feel like when I play solitaire, I'm, I'm wasting time, but I'm also, in some ways, in a, in a very weird way, connecting with my father through this solitary activity, which says a lot about my relationship with him, that we would connect through things we did very much al alone and apart. Because <laughs> you, are, you are a talker, you are. Yeah. But so, so you find yourself to, to, to look like your father much more than you re ever anticipated, and you're only finding it out two years after his death, a year, year and a half? Um, no, I think I always knew it. I've just been thinking about it more. Yeah. I've been thinking about it more. The book. Food and math. I mean, that sums it up. <laughs> a very brief, brief yeah. chapter about counting lentils and, yeah. and, and his fixation with the, with, the, with the food, with counting the lentils, but also his fixation with, with, with food. In the book, you, you see him suddenly run off after cooking a meal for his friends, um, being very upset that his Indian friends don't um, serve up for a third time, right. and he's very upset about it. He runs off, he disappears, which has happened in real life for, for about two weeks. Yes. And his friend Hardy finally finds him somewhere in Oxford, I believe. In Oxford, yeah. What, 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 what was that? What's, what's the connection with, between food and math and this, this thinking, with this, this the, well, hun, the Hindu calculator? Well, um, you know, food is such an important part of Hindu culture and South Indian culture. And uh, food is... I mean, food is, I think, important, is an important facet of any culture, but, but food has, has tremendous spiritual and religious significance for South Indians, um, who are, uh, as a rule, very, very strict vegetarians, and for whom eating has an almost kind of ritualized quality. Uh, 
one of the things I discovered when I was researching this book is that, is that food was really Ramanujan's great difficulty in England. Uh, he was used to eating um, a very st an, a strictly vegetarian South Indian diet, which would be a diet very rich in legumes, uh, very spicy, um, uh, a lot of fresh vegetables. And suddenly he finds himself in winter England during a war with rationing, and the sort of foods that, that, that he's used to eating he are just not available. And uh, in addition, I think there, there was probably a great cultural uh, gap. The, the English probably didn't understand why it was that he was so rigid in his dietary habits, why, why the idea of eating meat was so repugnant to him. Um, uh, there, there's a scene late in the novel, I think it's one of the, the saddest scenes, and it's, uh, again, based on a true episode where uh, Ramanujan uh, is given some Ovaltine to drink by uh, the landlady of a boarding house where he's staying in London, and he happens to discover that it has powdered egg, and he goes crazy because of the idea that without realizing it, he's, he's drunk something that has egg. And there's subsequently an air raid on London, and he, he interprets the air raid as a kind of punishment uh, for breaking this, this very, very strict dietary rule. So food really became an emblem of what isolated him in England, of what made him feel so much like an outsider. And at the same time, in his efforts to find the sorts of foods he was used to eating to cook for himself, he was really trying to establish a connection with a lost homeland. And, uh, and all that, I think, um, it, it, was, it was quite, uh, it, it seemed to me very natural in the novel to try to dramatize a lot of this through cooking and eating scenes. Let's get this number thing out of the way. Yeah. Math. <laughs> so are, are you a number man? No. You're not? No, um, I'm not at all. I, I stumbled into this subject completely by accident. That's nice of you. Um, I, I took high school calculus, and that was it. Uh, I never took a math class when I was in college, and I don't think I ever would have thought about this as a subject, except that I was um, approached uh, in about 2002 by a friend of mine, an editor named James Atlas, who was putting together a series of books called Great Discoveries. And he was asking mostly fiction writers to write books about scientific discoveries. And he said, would you be interested in doing a book about Alan Turing and the invention of the computer? Who's considered the father of computer science. Father of computer science and also yeah. uh, World War II. a code breaker. Yes. And uh, considered a sort of martyr to uh, the, the, the anti-sodomy laws in England. Uh, he committed suicide uh, after he was arrested um, for uh, committing acts of gross indecency, which was the, the euphemism. And he committed suicide by biting into an apple dipped in cyanide, which was sort of a nod to the, the witch in Snow White. So I agreed to write this book thinking that I would focus on Turing's life and kind of soft pedal the math. And as I researched it, I found myself getting increasingly fascinated by the mathematics and starting to, to uh, I found that I wanted to learn more and more and more about not just the mathematics that, that Turing was doing, but the, but the whole realm of number theory, which was uh, what he studied originally before he moved into computer science. And it was really while I was researching for the Turing book that I stumbled almost by accident upon the story of, of Hardy and Ramanujan. And it, it was an instantaneous thing. The minute I read the first very brief account of their lives, I thought, this is a novel I have to write. And I actually did write it, which is not usual for me. I mean, I say, this is a novel I have to write six times a day. Well, what was it that triggered that? Sorry? What was it that triggered that, that you really felt you well, had to write that book? It was, it was a combination of factors. It was um, the Hardy uh, interested me because he was a, a part of the, the sort of, he was a member of the Apostles, which was a, Cambridge secret society that in the years before the war had a pretty extraordinary membership. Um, E.M. Forster, Lytton Strachey, uh, John Maynard Keynes, Ludwig Wittgenstein, Bertrand Russell. And I'd always been very interested in, in that, um, the sort of early days of Bloomsbury. Um, oh, and, and Jaco Groot asked me to uh, acknowledge that today is Bloom's Day. So for those of you who are Joyceans, thank you for being here. Uh, 
So that was already an area of interest for me. Um, but just, just tell me, tell us some, something more about the apostles. The apostles. The apostles there was a group of closeted gays. No, not, not entirely. Not entirely. No. But it was it was the main. It, it was a secret society at Cambridge, and it was a it was an old secret society that 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 dated back to the 19th century, and that had included among its members probably its most famous member up to that point was Tennyson, um, and uh, the the. Society had it was very ritualized. It had its own kind of language that it spoke, its own terminology, and uh, always a, a limited number of members. And at the time uh, that I'm writing about, which were the years just before the the First World War, um, the society was in a particularly fertile period in that it it had a pretty remarkable membership. Uh, it was also, I think, a kind of a haven of sexual tolerance in England. And not, I think, exclusively gay, even though there were a lot of members of the apostles who were homosexual, but also tolerant of sexuality in a, in a broader sense. For example, Bertrand Russell uh, was, you know, the very opposite of mm. gay. He was a great womanizer, but 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 he was also living kind of outside the bounds and the mores of Victorian England, simply by virtue of the fact that he would often have two or three lovers at the same time. So it was a very uh, intellectually rich moment, and the Apostles was really the hotbed of change and of, of, of a kind of all sorts of new ways of thinking. Among the other members, Roger Fry, the art historian who, who was one of the great advocates of expressionism. Um, so uh, there, were, there were composers, there were writers, there, there, there was er everyone who was trying to do something new in England in those years was in some sense either a member of the Apostles or affiliated with the Apostles. Uh, Leonard Wolf was a member of the Apostles, and, and through him, Virginia Woolf was brought into that circle. So it was a very rich uh, group, very few scientists. Hardy was one of the only scientists, and I thought, what an interesting way to, to what, what an interesting oblique angle from which to approach this uh, group, principally of writers. So it was really the group of people that, the yeah. that, that determined the atmosphere of Cambridge at the time. Yeah. It was not necessarily the math aspect to it. Well, Cambridge was sort of a, I, I mean, in terms of mathematics at that time, England was, was not on the cutting edge. Mm -hmm. uh, everything really exciting was going on in Germany. And Hardy was very frustrated because in even trying to do pure mathematics, he was going against the grain of traditional conservative Cambridge thinking. And then when the war came, he was further separated from Germany because suddenly there was this uh, wall that came down between German mathematicians and English mathematicians. So Hardy was in his way a kind of a mathematical radical uh, from an English point of view, um, even though he was a fellow of Trinity College, even though he'd, he'd come up through the ranks in the, in the proper way. Um, so, so there was there was always this tension about being an insider and an outsider. This was always the question, I think, for both Hardy and Ramanujan. They were both, uh, in certain ways, insiders and in certain ways outsiders. And that was something else that I think bonded them together. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it was really the math that bonded them together, fi trying to figure out the Riemann hypothesis. Um, and, and just still a little puzzled. Then, then we'll leave it alone. Yeah, the math. The Riemann hypothesis. Where, yeah. The fact that you, you said you were triggered by math, you were mm -hmm. fascinated by it, even though you weren't very good in high school, what, then what was it then that really got you into it? Is, is it some sort of a fascination, an appreciation, like you would appreciate music or, or, or art or poetry? It was really, um, wh what really started me down this rabbit hole uh, w was, was thinking about prime numbers. Um, and prime numbers are the beginning of the Riemann hypothesis. I mean, the Riemann hypothesis has to do with the theory of prime numbers and, and, and the mystery of prime numbers. Um, and, and I think prime numbers have always been, uh, had this, this, this pull, this fascination, because there's something so mysterious about, a, a, a about the idea of, of, of the pattern that doesn't look like a pattern. Uh, the fact that prime numbers don't, that, that, that no one has ever been able to uh, figure out a, a method by which you can predict when the next prime number is going to come along. 
So that was really what, what, what drew me in, and it was what attracted Alan Turing to the theory of prime numbers. It was what attracted Hardy. It was what attracted Ramanujan. Um, the, the, the sort of mystery and the beauty and the abstractness of it, uh, which was so remote from my own experience because as a writer, I deal with the concrete. Um, mathematicians deal with the abstract, and I think the, the, the first requirement of a mathematician, um, and this is why I could never be a mathematician, is that you have to have the ability to abstract e anything. When, when Ramanujan is counting the lentils, he has to abstract the lentils. He has to stop thinking about lentils and how they're orange and how you can cook with them and their kind of physicality, and he has to start thinking about them purely as symbols. So mathematicians really move from the concrete to the abstract, whereas novelists tend to move the opposite direction. And that paradox interested me as well. Even though Ramanujan is not a character that was really explored, we never really get into his head. Yeah. We, we follow his life. He comes to England. We, we describe how um, um, uh, Neville and his wife go out to uh, India to persuade him to come out to, to, to Cambridge. Mm -hmm. But we never really get into his head. Is that because you were not too familiar with what was going on with him? That was a conscious decision. Um, I. Uh, I had a teacher, and, and I've been racking my brains trying to think which of my teachers it was who said this, because I credit I should give credit where credit's due, who told me once that, that essentially you could divide most novels into one of two categories. And the first category would be called A Man Goes on a Trip. And the second category would be called A Stranger Comes to Town. Well, this book could have been either one. I chose to write A Stranger Comes to Town. And the reason that I chose to write that was because I didn't feel that I had the authority to enter into the imagination of someone who, had, who was the product of a culture so remote from my own. Uh, I think there could be a, a whole other Ramanujan mm -hmm. novel that was, but I think it would have to be written by an Indian. A Man Goes on a Trip. A Man right. Goes on a Trip. And, and, and when I went to India, that was when this, it, it really became clear to me that, that the, the, the difference was too huge for me to, to, to be able to cross with any kind of authority. And so there are just two very brief scenes in the novel that enter a little bit into Ramanujan's head. But otherwise, Ramanujan remains the stranger whom the other characters endow with really whatever it is they need from him. On the contrary, when it comes down to Hardy, Mm -hmm. uh, written in the third person, not from an eye mm -hmm. view. Why did you decide to do that deliberately? Because it doesn't really reflect the, the language they use from that time, you know, from early last well, century. I did, I did both. There's a kind of alter there are these al occasional chapters in first person. Um, one thing that was that I decided very early on was I didn't want to write a period piece. I didn't want to write. I didn't want to pretend that this novel. I didn't want to create the illusion that the novel had been written at the time that it takes place. The novel I want to read as a novel written in the 21st century, but a novel about the 20th century. So that was a very conscious decision. I wanted to use a very, contempor very contemporary locution, contemporary language, present tense, um, alternation of point of view, although that's not actually terribly modern. It goes back to Dickens. Um, and to, to, to really make it clear that this was not a sort of pseudo artifact uh, because it seems to me that when you try, too often when you, when you try to write in the voice of another age, you can, I mean, it can be done very well, but, but more often than not, it seems to me what you end up producing is a sort of museum piece, not something that lives and breathes. So that was another a, a choice that I made, because writing fiction is constantly, you're making choices and decisions. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of agonizing in that way. You have to make so many decisions, um, What's the hardest so many choices. What's the agonizing over deci decisions when it comes down to trying to get an accurate portrayal of Cambridge at a time or where you have to decide at some point, well, I'm going into A.J. G.H. Uh, Hardy's head and yep. trying to have him come up with stuff and the coldness that you portray him with, for example. What is the hardest thing? For, for me, uh, point of view is always the, the, the great stumbling block. It's always the great decision. Uh, point of view is 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 and and I inevitably will try all sorts of points of view before I I finally come to the one that I 
most comfortable with. And when I was starting to write this book, I, tr I started it from Hardy's point of view. I wrote it from Littlewood's point of view. I created an American who was never there and had it from his point of view. Yeah. I, I went, I experimented a lot. And uh, I, I wrote a lot of pages that never saw the light of day because it seemed to me that was the only way to figure out what was going to work was to actually look at it, try it out and look at it. You did an enormous amount of research. I love research. <laughs> you do? Yeah, I love to do research. Uh, so yeah, I did, but I enjoyed it. It was fun for me. Because it, it has all these footnotes and referrals to books and history books. And, but it's, you do come to a point where you really start to fictionalize Oh, yeah. The whole a thing. lot of it is, I mean, do it's a novel. So do you feel like you have to have it all researched and then you can wander and... No, I think that, that, that actually if you over-research before you start to write, it can sort of kill your ability to write. Um, I was writing and researching simultaneously, which meant that I had to constantly go back and rewrite, but, but I rewrite all the time anyway. Um, and, uh, you know, if I, would, if I learned something that, that meant I had to go back and change what I'd written, I would just go back and change it. But I was also, you know, it really wasn't that different from any other kind of fiction writing that I've done. And I was taking bits and pieces and putting them together to create an imaginary whole. Uh, but it, instead of the bits and pieces coming from my own experience or from conversations I overheard, they were coming from archives. Um, you know, the diaries and letters, which are effectively gossip, yes. newspaper articles, um, documents, and in the same, it, it, it's, it's, I think what all novels are, they're, they're inventions made from material that is, that is part of the real world. But you put the material together in a way that, that, that is ultimately not the real world, if that makes sense. Um, uh, I, I was... Oh, was gossip, gossip, you mentioned gossip. Gossip is yeah. great. And at some points in the book you made some, especially the character Kings, make some yeah. extremely lewd insinuations. Oh, well, I didn't make them. I mean, those are all, those were all made by Lytton Strachey and his brother. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the lewd stuff about John Maynard Keynes is, is none of that was invented. That's all out there to well, be true found. Gossip. Yeah. The, the part of the book that is completely invented, there, there are two elements in the book that are pretty much completely invented. One is Hardy's affair with the soldier, uh, for which there's no evidence whatsoever. Because he, he takes care of a soldier who was wounded, comes back, he meets him, and then they has some sort of an affair right. or a relationship very, with very explicit sex scenes as well. And then the other part that, that's pretty much invented is the, the story of Alice Neville, who was a real person. She was married to, to one of Hardy's colleagues. She went with him to India. Um, in the novel, she falls in love with Ramanujan, and there was that was based on just very, very slender evidence. But I kind of uh, created something that, 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 that I, I, I took just, w it was really a classic example of what Henry James calls the Dunne, the little, the little uh, airborne, airblown grain, I think he calls it, that, that, that is the beginning of a story. And that was simply that, that years after Ramanujan died, when one of his friends came to see the Nevilles, Alice Neville said, um, why didn't, why didn't people let him wear Indian clothes? He would have been so much more comfortable and happy if he could have worn Indian clothes. And that tiny detail suggested to me that she cared about him in a way that very few other people did. And so from that, I extrapolated the idea of this strange passion okay. that she develops for him. That's too bad you married her. She was a very strong woman in the book. Well, I... She might have been a very strong woman in real life. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. uh, I could. F I found out almost nothing about her, which again gave me space to invent because there wasn't much of a record. Okay. Um, we have to talk about While England Sleeps, the, the book that is surrounded by contro controversy, um, um, a book about two Englishmen um, um, having a relationship with scenes that were, as a judge pointed out, were, were plagiarized. Um, no. Well, uh, okay, you tell the story. That's not true at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you tell That's a story. misrepresentation. I'm going to sue you. No, Good. I'm joking. Um, Good. Controversy. Uh, you no, the, the, you the, the, story. The, the story of, of Well England Sleeps, at least the way I would tell it, is simply that I wrote a novel based 
very similar to this. It was based on a real story. It was the story of, of, of the poet Stephen Spender's uh, love affair with a young man named Tony Hindman, who was fighting in the Spanish Civil War, got himself in prison, and Spender went to rescue him. And um, I was very naive at that time, and, and, and I didn't realize that, that Spender, who was at the time still alive, was, might feel very proprietary about this material. And uh, he sued me. Uh, in the UK, not in the United States, uh, claiming copyright infringement. It wasn't exactly plagiarism. He said that I had stolen his life. Or no, plagiarized his life. That was the way he put it. The word was used. And, uh, you know, no, he did use the word plagiarized, but that um, had much more to do with the fact that he had written a memoir, and the memoir was sort of what I used as the basis for the novel. And it was a pretty um, terrible thing to go through, uh, especially for a young writer who had always believed that, that everything was fair game, which I still believe. However, I have learned that if you're going to write about people who are alive, you need to take legal precautions um, because they can sometimes get very upset. <laughs> and, f and they can feel very proprietary. Uh, one of the interesting things about that book was that I changed all the characters' names. And I sometimes wonder if I would have had an easier time if I hadn't changed their names. I think it was partially the fact that I changed their names that I tried to, in a sense, claim the story as my own that, that, that was part of the problem. Because um, people have asked me with this book, why, haven't, why didn't you decide to make them into fictional characters? Why didn't you change their names so that you'd have more latitude? And I honestly didn't want the latitude. I wanted the restraint of, of real facts. Uh, because in some ways, not having that restraint was, I think, what got me into some of the hot water that I got into with Welling and Sleeps. Um, Curiously enough, I think Spender would have been less offended if I had called the character Stephen Spender because at least then it would have in some ways acknowledged that this was his life, uh, which has taken me a long time to come to realize. Um, anyway, the upshot of it was that, that uh, he brought this lawsuit and my publisher in England uh, at the time settled by agreeing to withdraw the book. I, in a sense, rewrote the book to distance it a little bit from... Spender's life, and a new edition was subsequently published, and that's the edition that's still in print. With uh, three less pages. Are I've there three less pages? I thought it was three. I rewrote a lot of it. Okay. It, w it was not just a question of cutting. A lot how of it was How did it hold you back? Did it, I mean, it must have upset you as well. It took a long time to come up with the next book. How, well, how, does it still restrain you in a way, no. or just, is that restraint now necessary to know where you can go and what you cannot do? Since that happened, so many writers have been at the receiving end of lawsuits like this. It, mine was really the first, but there have been a whole succession of them. Um, and m uh, one of the most recent being, of course, Ian McEwen, uh, who was, who was uh, similar accusations were made against him by a woman whose book he used as uh, some of the ba basis for some of the material in atonement. And I think that, that, that over time, um, increasingly the feeling that there, there, there's, there's less and less sympathy for these people who bring these lawsuits, and more and more I think the feeling that they're essentially trying to, to, to get attention or to claim a kind of ownership of their lives that none of us can really have. You know, none of us can really own our lives after we're dead. Maybe we can sort of own them while we're alive. We were talking about J.D. Salinger, mm. who's brought another lawsuit to someone else who's very, very proprietary about his life. So, um, you know, at the time, it seemed to me that there was a lot of injustice, uh, but, but, but I feel vindicated, or I felt over the years vindicated. And of course, if I hadn't had that experience, I never would have written The Term Paper Artist, which was one of the best things I've ever written, I would say, that was really, uh, that was a novella, which the Spender episode was sort of the jumping off point. And it caused its own minor controversy when it came out. It, it, it's, it's, it's published in the book Arkansas. It's one story where if A. David Levitt goes out to um, California and, and um, sells term papers to young students who are willing to perform homosexual acts, um, vice versa. And that's, that's the part that was made up, right? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm, pleading, don't know. I'm not going to say. No, the, the, the controversy over that story was that it was supposed to be published in Esquire. And... Uh, Literally 24 hours before it went to press, the the publisher pulled the story 
and the fiction editor quit in protest. And it turned out that she was worried that, the publisher was worried that Chrysler was gonna, uh, was gonna pull its advertising from the magazine because they would be, the, the very conservative company would be offended um, by the story. And, and, and the rumor was that Chrysler had demanded it, but in fact Chrysler had never seen the story. And subsequently it became a kind of a, a, a test case of the degree to which the advertising arm of a magazine mm. ought to or ought not to have any control over the editorial aspect. Uh, so th there was, that was a period in my life when I felt like I couldn't put a step right. I yeah. kept, uh, it must be terrible to not being able where your creative freedom begins or ends. Well, and in that case, what was strangest about it was that, of course, the story got so much more attention than it ever would have if it had just been published in Esquire. So my publisher was thrilled um, and put stickers on the book saying, too hot to handle. <laughs> uh, t but I would personally have preferred if it had just had a quieter appearance. Um, and I suppose the other thing is that, that, that this question of, of ownership, the extent to which any of us owns our lives, is really one that has continued to preoccupy me. Um, and it, it's a, to me, it's a fascinating question. Uh, well, can you answer that question? Where, how, far, how far are you and how far do you own your own life? I don't though? consider myself to own my own life at all. Um, I'm fair game. I'm open season. Uh, I've said ever since this happened, anyone can write anything they want about me, and I won't object. Um, no one has, because in fact my life's not very interesting. Uh, but um, I have no illusions about that, and I, have n I don't really care particularly about privacy. Um, this may be part of, of having come of age as a, as a gay man in the 1980s when, you know, the most important thing was to come out, to be public, to be open. And when, when, when the, the sort of cri de cour of your generation is openness, no secrets, you know, break down the closet doors, how can you then think of privacy as a positive thing? You know, or, or, or how can you attempt to, to, to sort of veil your own life or, or, or try to keep control over your own life? I mean, I consider myself fair game for other writers just as they're fair game for me. Did it feel like that? That was, that was like the ultimate thing to do in the 80s, to come out as a gay person, to really... Oh, yeah. Kicking and screaming and How yelling they, and what, shouting. and What happened? How did that? Uh, uh, it was fine. Um, you know, uh, it was it was an age of drama, uh, I would say. I mean, my own coming out experience, which I've written about, was was very peculiar because typically I did it by writing a story. The first story I published in the New Yorker, and and when the New Yorker accepted the story, I realized, well, I better tell my parents I'm gay <laughs> because they're going to figure it out when they read the story. So, so I had to sort of rush home and tell them before. <laughs> the story came out. That's not true. They did not know that? No, they didn't know. Seriously. I was 20. Wow. I wouldn't, I, I hadn't had that conversation with them yet. So it was you sort get, of. So you gave them a copy of the New Yorker or you said. It like hadn't come out. I said, well, mom, dad, I'm coming out in the New Yorker. <laughs> uh, to which your parents said. Uh, they, well, they, uh, they thought I meant in the other sense of coming out. But um, essentially I think it was, a, it, w it was sort of saying, well, the good news is that your son has become a successful writer. The, the other good news, which you may interpret as bad news, is that he's become a successful writer by writing about the fact that he's gay. So, uh, but my parents were very, you know, tolerant, liberal people, and I think it, it sort of, it didn't floor them for very long. Uh, what was your first sentence where you started realizing you were a writer? Do you remember a story or a sentence or a word or a feeling that made you a writer, which I'm sure you wrote bef long before you were 20. Yeah. Um, curiously enough, when I was a child, um, I listened, I loved uh, pop music and folk music, and I was always listening to Joni Mitchell and Bob Dylan. And the first things I attempted to write when I was maybe nine were songs. I had a guitar. <laughs> And I would write songs, with terrible, terrible songs. And, and then I started writing poetry. Um, once I realized that I was completely non-musical, uh, 
<laughs> and that I, there's no way that I was going to become the next Bob Dylan. <laughs> um, and then the poems all started turning into stories, and that was really how I became a prose writer. Remember poems? Not really. I mean, this was a long time ago. So we're talking 32 years ago or 30 years ago. So uh, that must be a sentence. I'll remember. pretend I don't remember. Yeah, that's right. I thought of you. Yeah. Right. Yes. But did you <laughs> did you did you did you start did you use writing to to for for uh, as a gay person right away? Did you feel like that was the only way to express? Mm -hmm. I think subconsciously, mm -hmm. yeah, because all my earliest stories that I wrote when I was a teenager were in some ways about um, sexual difference. Uh, I don't think I even really knew what I was writing, but but I was constantly drawn to that subject. And um, it was really through writing that I came to terms with my own, my being gay. It was really through the process of writing that first story that was The New Yorker that, that I was able to kind of reconcile myself to the reality that, that at that point and at that very young age, I, I, I hadn't previously been prepared to, to acknowledge. I mean, there, there's a funny thing that I think happens to young gay people, particularly teenagers, which is that you almost separate the sexual side of your nature from the rest of you as if, as if that's someone different. And you imagine that you can continue your life keeping it completely separate. And some people do continue their lives keeping it completely separate. But I reached a point when I was about 20 where I, I had to go through that, that very difficult process of integration. And I did it through writing. And then in the New Yorker, you know, turning you into a published author. Yes. With reputation and responsibility, a pressure that might have been relieved, but also probably caused another s form of pressure for you as a newly discovered yeah, writer <laughs> within a specific area. Of well, that was the age of the so-called literary brat pack, of which I was a sort of peripheral member. There was a kind of um, this idea of a, it, it was really Jay McInerney, Brett Easton Ellis, who, these were not writers I knew very well or, or really had much to do with, but but there was this sort of idea of, of this brat pack, these young, hip writers in New York, and I was always kind of on the I, I was always sort of mentioned as kind of a, a, an associate member, I suppose you could say. Um, and it was very contrary to my nature. Uh, I was not, even at that age, a particularly uh, public person. I was pretty reclusive and pretty distrustful of that sort of limelight. So I, I, I really uh, withdrew from it pretty early on because I sensed that it was going to come back and bite me. Um, but, but that was sort of how I, I really, that was, that was the moment when I was probably the most famous is that, I, I, it, that moment sort of around 1985 when, when journalists all over the world were sort of fascinated by this idea that there was this new generation of young writers in New York and they were all going out together to nightclubs and restaurants and, and hanging around together and being very kind of cool, which was true, except that I was never part of it. They were all off having fun. Why, why, weren't, you, why weren't you part of it? I didn't like it. Uh, I mean, there were a couple things that were going on. One was that I've just never been a nightlife person. I mean, uh, my habit is I usually go to bed at 10. Um, I'm not a late night person at all. I never have been. Also, I was very, at that point in my life, and I say this with a grain of salt, I was very interested in being gay. That was pr my principal preoccupation in my life. I was really fascinated go, uh, by homosexuality. And going to bed at 10. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> not necessarily alone, but you know. Uh, so, so I was living, I was traveling in very different circles. I was not traveling in the sort of literary um, kind of nightlife world that Jay McInerney traveled in. I was, I was off with all the gay radicals, the, the leftists, the the, the activists. That was really much more my milieu. Um, and uh, yeah, and then I was also just, again, not, I'd never really been a night owl. I'd never been a night person. So I, uh, it took me a long time to be willing to be proud of that. Um, I always felt like there was something sort of, that I was always sort of a shut in, as they say in the South. What, what's, what is, what's a shut in. Shut in. Someone who never leaves the house. Hmm. <laughs> Which I am, essentially. But what were you proud of then? Well, I think, 
I don't know. Um, you know. Well, it shows in the books. I mean, you're I proud mean, of being a gay writer, even though you didn't really want to be seen as a gay writer, but you've really yeah, uh, pr produced a, a long series of work that I'm are. We're all creatures of contradiction. Um, you know, Ramanujan desperately wanted to be famous and also desperately wanted to be uh, an outsider. How do you reconcile those two things? Um, I'm, I'm very much the same. I mean, I'm full of contradictions, uh, and I'm proud of it. <laughs> but, um, you know, my mother was, was a very, uh, in some ways, a very reclusive person. I think I kind of inherited from her a tendency to be reclusive. And also, I think, by and large, writers tend to be reclusive because you kind of have to be by yourself a lot mm -hmm. when you write. It's, it's just part of the job. Um, and uh, when I was younger, I would, uh, and, and I think a, a lot of times I would, the, the antidote to that, that isolation was to sort of go out and be with other people. And now, um, as I get older, I tend to want to just stay home with my dog. Um. <laughs> Does it lead to better literature? Sorry? Does it lead to better literature? You feel like you, you really need that reclusiveness to, to really get into these kinds no. of books? No. I, it's not, I don't think there's, that, that it's anything that, that, that I would advocate. It's just my nature. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have a lot of friends who are much more creatures of social life than I am. Uh, they love going out to dinner. They love going out with friends. They, and I like to do that occasionally, but, but, but I don't like to do it every night. And, and I look at someone like my friend Edmund White, who, who claims that he goes to more dinner parties in a year than Henry James. And I would have to commit suicide if I, if I had to live that way. It's just so much not my nature. Okay. Well, I'm, sur I'm surprised. I mean, we're having a very pleasant evening. Oh, I'm, a not, very nice dinner. I'm not antisocial by, I, I just, um, I don't do it a lot. Let's yeah. put it, I, I should clarify. So what's your work day li look like then? Well, it depends on whether I'm teaching. Mm -hmm. um, you teach in Florida? I teach at the University of Florida and uh, um, I've just finished a sabbatical. So I've, I've, I've been, I haven't been teaching since December. Um, and uh, I've just been writing, and that tends to be, uh, it, it really depends. I go through periods when I don't write at all. I go through periods when I write constantly. I, I, I go through periods when I write in the mornings. I go through periods when I write in the afternoons. I'm, I'm very erratic in that regard, in my habits as a writer. Um, Was it just come to you? You sit down and you feel like I have to do it now? Well, uh, I, I usually, w I work really hard. Um, and, and usually if I'm not writing, I'm researching. Uh, so I'm, I'm constantly working, um, uh, but not in a methodical way, in the sense that I, I have a very close friend who writes every day from 9 to 12, mm -hmm. except on Sundays. And I couldn't, I've tried, and it just doesn't work for me. Sometimes I get distracted, or I want to do something else, or I play solitaire all morning, <laughs> you know, or, or I take my dog for a walk, you know. Um, sometimes I write in the evenings, sometimes I write in the mornings. It, it really depends uh, on, on where I am with a project. Um, when I'm teaching, I actually have a much more, uh, uh, much more scheduled life because I have to. I, I don't have as much free time and therefore I need to organize my time better, which is one reason why I think teaching is actually very good for writers in that it, it, it does force upon you uh, a schedule, and it also forces you to get out in the world and interact with other people, which you might otherwise never do. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I do have some questions about it, but I'm not sure. Yeah. What are we doing on time? Because I want to give it to the audience too. I don't want to. Yes, please. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of questions. With the microphone we have here. So, who has a burning math question? <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's let's get the microphone so we have it on camera as well. Yes. <laughs> I can hear you if you want to yes, go ahead. The camera. Okay. Just write along or tell us a little bit about what. Well, it 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 every novel I've written. I felt like I've gone back to kindergarten. Um, it's it's always uh, each novel. I feel like I I've ha I I wish I could 
benefit from the experience of the last, but, but I always feel like I'm starting at square one. And each novel has, has progressed in a very different way. The novel I'm working on now, um, which is going very, very slowly, um, is, I've been, it's been a, a constant rewriting, uh, almost to a degree that, I, that I'm a little worried about. I, I, I keep rewriting and rewriting and rewriting and starting from a different point, um, which is what I've always done. It, it tends to be very anxiety-provoking because I never feel certain that, that what I've written is really going to stick. Um, but usually I start off with some sort of, you know, again, to use that expression of Henry James, the, the done the the air-blown grain, some little... Uh, deta- something that's a beginning. In this case, it was just a very brief account of the relationship between Hardy and Ramanujan. And then um, I, st- I, I try to learn as much as I can. And then I, I kind of, I start throwing words down on the computer or on paper s- to see if a story comes out of it. And sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. Um, one thing... That, that, that I've discovered increasingly is that, that the writing process happens it, through my fingers, not in my mind. In other words, I, if, I, if I just sit and think about an idea, I don't get anywhere. I have to actually sit down and write. And when I sit down and I start writing, I often find myself going places that I would never have imagined I would go. So one piece of advice that I always give to my students is is to write as regularly as you can, even if you don't feel like it, even if you feel like you'd rather have your nails pulled out, to force yourself to write, because it's really through that process that you create, that the story comes into being. Um, and if you, you can think about it and think about it and think about it, and it won't get you anywhere if you don't actually sit down and start writing. So do you start with a story or a story idea? Do you start with a character that you start writing about? Because you do a lot of research, you say. Yeah. And especially this one, you start rewriting. But what are you rewriting, the research or the story idea that you started off with? Well, the problem with this novel is that I still feel like the story hasn't come clear yet. Uh, it's, I, I feel like I have a situation. I have characters. I have a time. I have events. I don't, I'm still waiting for the story to emerge. I feel like it's right on the brink of emerging. But it, but it's it's a very anxious moment when because you're never sure that it, when the story hasn't been born you, you don't know that it's actually going to be um, in the case even in the case of the Indian clerk where the the story was fairly clear cut as as an historical uh, episode um, there were constant decisions to make about what to focus on which particular periods really. I mean, there, there, were, there were the events and there was the story. And the trajectory of the story is something that's independent from the trajectory of history. And, uh, you know, that's where you have to really trust your instincts and your intuition. And it can be very, very tough. Would you mind coming up to the microphone so we can also tape it? So what do you do when you're at that point, when you're stuck waiting for not the characters to come, but the story? What do you, it, do you just keep writing? Do you sit and think? Do you research all three? I just keep writing. Mm-hmm. I keep writing and I keep writing and I keep writing. And I, I will either reach a point where I give up or it happens. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it clicks. Um, and, and to some extent, you, you know, you're going on faith. Uh, you have to have, uh, usually when something isn't going to work, for me at least, that becomes evident fairly early on, but it can often take a really long time for something, t- for, for a novel or a story to actually m- kind of manifest itself in its final incarnation. Um, but again, l- I need to emphasize, this is my method, mm-hmm. and it's not necessarily the, the only one or the best. Um, I mean, every writer I know has such a d- different approach to the writing process, and, and uh, um, there are people who really, there are writers who I think really do write their novels in their heads and then they just write them down. I envy them. Mm. I wish I could do that. Um, you mentioned uh, Ramanushan being an outsider, mm-hmm. so vegetarian and Indian and Britain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I, th I assume you too felt as an outsider as you were growing up being gay and Jewish in a straight Gentile world, uh, living abroad as some of us have done, as mm -hmm. an American abroad. Mm -hmm. Does that still play a role in your gestalt, being the outsider now and infusing perhaps every book you will ever write? Absolutely. Um, you know, I really feel that at the, the, the core of, of anyone's identity there are contradictions. And, and there are contradictions that you just can't get past, which is why in some ways I can tell you that I'm, I'm a very talkative social person and I'm also deeply antisocial at the same time. Well, I think one contradiction that is at the core of my being is that I've always felt very much like an insider and very much like an outsider. Uh, and that was, I think, one reason that I was very drawn to these characters, because there, there was that contradiction in them as well. Um, if you look at G.H. Hardy, he, he was an insider, certainly from the point of view of Ramanujan. He was a fellow of Trinity College. He'd, he'd, been, uh, the, he'd, he'd gotten all the rewards that the educational system in England had to offer. He'd, he'd followed the trajectory that had been plotted for him. At the same time, Hardy himself felt very much like an outsider because he was gay, he was an atheist, uh, he was a leftist, he was a pacifist. Uh, there, he was from a, 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 a poor, uh, not exactly working class, but, but certainly non-aristocratic background living amid aristocrats. So in a sense, he was, he, he was, he was an insider from Ramanushan's point of view, but an outsider from his own. And, and that's often how I feel, uh, I, I feel that contradiction in myself frequently, if not constantly. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned that I'm Jewish. Uh, this is something I, I've, I've only really started writing about and thinking about very recently. Um, I was raised in a very assimilated Jewish family in California. Um, and like a lot of Californian Jews, with virtually no sense of Jewish identity or religious identity, and um, it's only very recently that I've started thinking very deeply about my own Jewishness and my, my own, I've started to learn a little bit more about my family history. Uh, and um, that's starting to inform my work more and more. And it may be that I just had to reach a point in my life where I was able to start to think about it seriously. What's, what's that taking you to, what's, what's that taking you now? What is, what is that you've discovered then? Well, um, my grandparents uh, were immigrants from Lithuania who uh, came to the United States in the 1890s uh, during the period of the pogroms and during the period of, of mandatory military conscription under the Tsar when so many young Jewish men were, were either leaving or they were deliberately maiming themselves in order to avoid uh, conscription. And my, f my grandfather came to the United States with his brother in order to escape military conscription and one of his brothers as he put it made himself cross-eyed so that he wouldn't have to go into the czar's army I still don't quite understand what that was but I, I gather it was a very common thing for for young Jewish men to deliberately injure themselves or or you know pierce their eardrums that sort of thing so that they could no longer be uh, they, they, could, they would not the the army would reject them and um, I had, uh, then I discovered, of course, that like most Jews, I had relatives who died in the Holocaust. Uh, you know, relatives of my grandfather, uh, his brothers and sisters who stayed in Lithuania, their, their children, all of whom more or less disappeared. And this was something that I never had any consciousness of as a child. It wasn't exactly a secret, but it was just something that we were never, I think my parents actually felt that they were, that it was to our benefit to think of ourselves only as Americans and to not have a consciousness of our own history, that somehow consciousness of our history would, would inhibit us or, or burden us. Which it's quite remarkable for Jewish people who always bring, bring well, their history to the next generation and the next was, generation. It was California. I don't know how to emphasize this, but when I've talked to other Jews who grew up in California, a lot of them had the same experience. My parents moved from the West Coast to California and it was almost like another level of emigration. They were moving away from the more entrenched Jewish communities of the East Coast, I think in order to feel themselves liberated mm -hmm. from their own upbringings in the same way that their parents had immigrated from Europe. So you never talk about this with your father? I talked with my father toward the end of his life, yeah, uh, but only maybe in the last seven years, seven or eight years, did we talk about it. So what did it tell you? 
he taught me a lot of. No, but uh, what did it mean to you? What, how does it shape you then? If you well, it makes me feel a sense of a connection to history that I I didn't necessarily feel a personal connection, um, and uh, that you know I think is an in, it was an important milestone for me in terms of of, of growing up. I mean, you know, we're we're all growing up constantly. And, and you do as much growing up in your 40s, I think, as you do in your 20s. And this was part of my growing up I of my 40s, was discovering that I came from somewhere besides California. That's a good thing, right? I think it's a very good thing, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Please. David, it's nice to see you back in Europe. Thank you. I had first heard you read at the Institute of North American Studies in Barcelona. Oh, really? Once upon a time. Wow. And of course, so we were in Barcelona living at the same time. Uh -huh. and of course, I was so impressed that the city of Barcelona would invite a young author to live in residence. Uh -huh. uh, and then, of course, ran into you in Rome after that. And I think the last I left off, you were living in Italy. Yes. One of the comments you made then, and it touches on what we're hearing, and now we hear about your father, where it used to be about the mother. Yes. And it was, you made the comment, you felt that you were so popular in Spain and Italy <laughs> because the Latin mother so yes. resembled the Jewish mother. Yes, yes. <laughs> and so it seems to me I, that that Jewish element, whatever it may be, at least in the form of the family dynamic, uh, was, was very strong there. Absolutely. But, uh, but on that, that, and then maybe you can just reflect a little bit more, it seems you've gone back to, your, uh, to the U.S. to live. Yes. And maybe where those experiences have gone in these 20 years into your psyche. Well... You know, um, it's interesting. I, I uh, let me talk a little bit more about religion. I um, I grew up oddly enough uh, because I think it's oddly enough because it's, it's fairly rare even now with virtually no sense of religious identity at all. I mean, I knew I was a Jew, but that didn't really mean anything to me. It was sort of this abstraction. It it, it was not in any way a pressing part of my identity. And then I lived all these years in Italy. Um, in the middle of, of the Catholic Latin world, and, 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 and I found that, that, that I started becoming really fascinated by Catholicism, um, uh, and n also noticing, again, a lot of cultural similarities between Italian Catholic families and, and Jewish families like the one I'd grown up in, both matriarchies with, with strong maternal figures really standing at the center, and, and generally you know, to follow the cliche, sort of slightly <coughs> weaker, more absent fathers. Um, but of course, there are also, you know, enormous differences between, uh, between Catholicism and Judaism. And that's something that I've, I've been thinking about more and more, especially as I have been reflecting and reading a lot about the, the really fairly frequent phenomenon of, of Jewish conversion to Catholicism, which is something that sort of fascinates me. Um, I, I recently was reading a wonderful book uh, by one of the great writers on all the questions that preoccupy me, Janet Malcolm. And this was her book, Two Lives, uh, her book about Gertrude Stein and Alice B. Toklas. And uh, this is a great, great book. And, and I saw two copies today at the Athenaeum. Um, so it is easily ex available here in, in, in Holland uh, about Gertrude Stein's relationship with Alice B. Toklas, about her own anti-Semitism as, as a Jewish lesbian. And, and one of the interesting details, is, which I never knew, was that Alice B. Toklas converted to Catholicism after the Second World War and after the death of Gertrude Stein, which seemed incredibly strange to me. Uh, but but I'm, I'm kind of discovering more and more that this was not an uncommon phenomenon, especially in France. So, you know... Uh, I'll say one last thing, which is that since I moved back to the States, which was nine years ago, my artistic orientation has become increasingly European. In other words, I seem to always write about the place I don't live. Uh, when I lived in Italy, I was always writing about America. Now that I'm back in America, I'm, I'm constantly writing about Europe. <laughs> Go figure. I don't know why. Well, that's, that was going to be my question. Why? Why is that? Because well, then only you can step back and reflect yeah, on what it was. So. You can fantasize about it, how it could have been or might have been. I think the fantasy element is, is, yeah. is crucial. Um, uh, it's the idea of a, of a sort of lost world, um, which you recreate in your imagination. Um, I, I just read an, 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 an amazing novel. 
Joseph Roth's novel, The Tale of the Thousand and Second Night, uh, which I read in a magnificent English translation by my, my friend and, and colleague at the University of Florida, Michael Hoffman. Um, and I know that uh, there are, are superb Dutch translations of Roth as well. But this is a novel that he wrote in 1938, uh, shortly before his suicide, when as a Jewish Austrian, he, had, he was living in Paris. He knew he could never go back to Vienna. So he recreated a kind of dream Vienna of his youth. It's a Vienna in its heyday of the no late 19th century. And the novel describes a visit by the Shah of Persia to Vienna. And, and there's speculation that, that it was in part um, an allegory, but also it was escapist for him. It was a way at a, at a terrible moment uh, to be a Jewish writer in Europe. It was a way to, to retrieve a city that he had lost. So, so I think writing is often about that kind of retrieval of what you don't have and and um, if you're that that's why I think we we do tend to write about places we're not you found something that you didn't think you had that that heritage um, your mm -hmm. ancestors in Lithuania you, mm -hmm. you've been there you think you write about no it? I'd love to go I haven't been to Lithuania mm. uh, yet <laughs> but I would like to go how's it gonna be you think I can't imagine um, you know it's it's uh, several of my relatives have gone um, and I think it's, it must, it would be a very moving experience mm -hmm. to sort of return to the earth that you came out of. I mean, I think it's a, it, it's a, it's a unique experience for Jews just because the nature of the diaspora is such that, that where you, where you live isn't necessarily where your ancestors lived. And, and when I lived in Italy, I was living in a village where the same families had been there for 600 years. And that was deeply appealing to me because it was so much the opposite of my own experience. The idea that, that you would have your roots in a village for going back so far w w was so different from the Jewish experience. And I, I was very drawn to that idea of rootedness, which is so much a, such an important facet of Italian life. How did you feel at home then? Hmm? How, how did you feel at home then with, with that history I felt, like an, I felt like an adopted child. I f the Italians welcomed me. I really felt like I was, in a sense, part of the family. But probably like most adopted children, I also felt a little bit of a sense that there was a point beyond which I couldn't go. You mentioned your teaching. I was wondering what do the students, uh, you get out of the students, the students get out of you. You mentioned a bit about what you get from them, but vice versa. Mm. And the second question, what were you doing in Italy, if I may be so curious? Well, I'll answer the second question first. I was, I lived in Italy from about 1992 until 2000. Um, these were great years to be an American in Europe. The dollar was strong. <laughs> Bill Clinton was president. The stock market was doing well. Uh, books were selling. I, it was great. It was cheap. I lived well. It was fantastic. I could never do it again. I could never afford to. Uh, which leads into the second question. That was one of the main reasons I went back was I had to get a job. I, you know, I couldn't live, I couldn't afford to live that kind of life anymore. Um, but I also believe in teaching. I think that, that, that I think of teaching as a, as a kind of, um, you know, uh, the, the, it seems to me there's a, there's a certain duty to to pass on what you know about a craft, just the same way that musicians will, will take on pupils. And that's how I kind of approach teaching, because I teach a cr creative writing almost exclusively. Um, and, and I tend to take a very kind of craft-based approach. And I hope that what my students get out of, of uh, what, what I try to do is I, I, I try to, first of all, make them open their eyes to writers they might not know. I, I often have them read people they don't initially want to read, whom they resist reading, but whom they ultimately, I think, come to appreciate. And then I, I try to make them just obtain the clarity that they need in order to be the best versions of themselves that they can be. Um, it's interesting. My students tend to be very different from me as writers. And my colleagues and I 
when we do our admissions, and like most creative writing programs in the United States, ours is extremely competitive. We only admit uh, about 3% of the students who apply. Um, we tend to all be drawn to the students who are most different from us. And if there's a joke that we have, which is that if an applicant says to the question, why do you want to attend the University of Florida? Because I love Paget Powell, then Paget Powell will, will hate that application. If the applicant says, I love David Levitt, then David Levitt will hate the application. And um, it almost always works out this way. It's as if we have this aversion to writers who aspire to write like us and an attraction to ones who are very different. And how do they perceive you then? Um, I think they, they, you know, I think they see that if it works, they recognize that there's a common ground that we all have, no matter how different we are mm -hmm. as writers, which is that we're all pursuing a craft. And it's a craft which has its own tools and its own materials. And um, there's certain common ground that, that uh, Gertrude Stein and uh, George Eliot, and I'm trying to think who, who could be more different from Gertrude Stein and George Eliot, um, oh, Georges Simenon, have in common, which is that we're all using the same materials. We're using language and punctuation and, and pencils and computers and trying to communicate with each other. Uh, and uh, probably that is, 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 if a workshop is successful, it's successful on that level. It's successful when, in a sense, the writers leave each other alone to be themselves rather than try to force them into some other mold. And I think part of the reason that I tend to uh, pull away from, from students whose writing is too much like mine is that there's too much of a sense of identification and it's hard to, to maintain the clarity that you need in order to teach when you feel that someone is emulating you or knows too much about you. I'd almost rather have a student who didn't like my work at all. <laughs> because it does come down to a craft. Not only the area, Gainesville, Florida, is not really a well, it might be an escapist area. <laughs> or it has its, it has its, its, um, it has its, its devotees, and it has its resident genius, who is Harry Cruz. Um, I don't know if Harry Cruz is is known in Holland, but uh, but he's uh, he's the great Gainesville writer. He was a sort of a wild man writer who, uh, when he taught at the university, was sort of famous for arriving in class drunk on a motorcycle, shooting off a pistol. Um, very, very much like me, you know, I, I, that's what I do. Uh, after, after 10 o'clock in your dreams. Yeah, exactly. So, so you do consider it to be a craft and that's how you can ha have students incite their fantasy into their creative work. Yeah, and, and I will say one thing about Gainesville is it's, it's actually a great place to be a, a young writer because it's, there's not a whole lot of distraction. I often wonder how writers can, especially young writers, can get anything done in New York because in New York there's so much to do all the time. Gainesville, there's a lot less to do, so presumably they write more, sometimes. Well, that's a, that's a piece, of, piece of great advice. I think the best advice from you as a prolific writer, but also as a teacher, is I think what you said earlier, like, that like every book that you write is going back to kindergarten. Yes. It's, it's <laughs> good, I think it's a good tip for every one of us. Um, whatever we do, go back to the basics and in order to get better in what we do and who we are. And I think you gave a good insight of that I tonight. Th I think you do learn. I think you become you learn, you become better, but at the same time, it doesn't feel that way. Uh, maybe in retrospect, you can look back and say, yes, I learned, yes, I got better. But I do feel that every time I sit down to start something new, I'm, I, it, it's like I have to learn how to write all over again, uh, which as I get older can get a little bit tiresome, but, but it's also fun. As hard as this is a great consolation. Thank you, David Levitt. Thank you. Thank you.